cue the music. Right, good morning to you, and thanks for joining us for the first edition of the 2014 Plants, Pests, and Pathogens webinar. I'm Lucy Bradley. I'm the Urban Horticulture Specialist at NC State. Delighted to be your MC this morning. I also want to welcome Lee J. Temple, who's our instructional technologist. Lee J. Good morning, everyone. Um, I just wanted to show you a couple of things about the Collaborate environment. Um, the main area where the presentation is happening is the whiteboard. To the left, at the very top, you'll see a talk button. If you have a question, you can um, verbalize it over your microphone. Uh, right under that, you have the participants window. Under your name, there are some icons. There's a smiley face um, and a way, a hand. Um, you can click that to raise your hand if you have a question. Um, there's also a, a checkbox, a green check and a red X. If you can click the green check if you see that. All right, if you have any questions, right below the participant window um, is the chat area. You can type in your questions as you have them for our presenters, or if you have any questions about the technology, you can also do that. If um, you want to interact with the whiteboard, uh, say, for instance, we want to know where you're coming from, then you can click on the um, starburst, sunburst icon, and then click on the map to let us know where you are today. All right, looks good. Thanks, Lee Jay. We've got a great program set up for you today. Charlotte Glenn from Pender County is going to be giving a talk on native plants. Um, Mark Blevins will be here with Showstoppers, and um, Matt Bertone with Entomology, and Mike Munster with Plant Pathology. So we'll kick off with Charlotte. Charlotte, welcome. Thank you so much for, for joining us and, and sharing your knowledge about native plants. All right, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Charlotte Glenn, and I'm the horticulture agent in Pender County, which you can see in red there is down on the southeast coast. And really the whole reason I am a horticulturist today is because of native plants. That's where I got my interest in gardening, is um, observing the, the wild plants and trying to cultivate them. So I have a lifelong appreciation of native plants, and I'm happy to share that with you today. So I wanted to start off just by talking about what is a native plant. Um, and I really like this definition because it clears up some of the debate about what is native. And it really speaks to the reasons why we want to plant natives. And this is from Douglas Tallamy, who is an entomology professor at the University of Delaware. And many of you are familiar with his work um, with the book Bringing Nature Home. And this is actually not from that book. This is from a new book he has coming out uh, later this year in June that he's co-authored with Rick Dark uh, called The Living Landscape. But this definition is a plant is a native plant if it has evolved in a given place over a period of time sufficient to develop complex and essential relationships with the physical environment and other organisms in a given ecological community. So I want to look at a couple of the aspects of that definition. 
Um, first is a given place, and that's really important when we talk about native plants, is native to where. Um, so just at a, a really broad level, we can look at North Carolina as having three main ecoregions, the mountains, the Piedmont, and the coastal plain. Of course, there's many subregions within each of those, um, many different natural communities within each of those. Um, but it's very important whenever we're defining native to talk about what region we're talking about. Um, and of course, to keep in mind that natives don't understand county lines and state lines. They understand soil conditions and climate conditions. So there generally isn't a reason to define native just as your specific county. It's Pender County. Um, but looking at the, the region where you are and the conditions that exist there. Um, then over a period of time, that is really thousands of years. So it doesn't include recently introduced plants that come from other regions and naturalized here. Um, so plants such as Japanese honeysuckle and Asian wisteria, even though they can be found in the wild, they are not native. Um, they are introduced plants, and they actually are reducing um, the value of our natural habitats because they don't support these essential relationships like our native plants do. So the essential relationships would be um, all of the pollinators that rely on the native plants because we have so many species of native pollinators, many of which are specialized to feed on native plants. We have others, uh, you know, including honeybees that have naturalized in our area and they're more generalist feeders so they can feed on a lot of different things. Um, we have all the insects which make up the base of the food chain, the insect, our native insects which have to feed on the native plants because so many of these insects have very specialized relationships with plants and everything that depends on those. Um, and in Bringing Nature Home, we learn a lot about how reliant birds are on insects. It's what they must feed baby birds if they're developing. So it's very important to support those native insects. Um, although often as gardeners we think, ah, we don't want bugs in the garden. Um, but a lot of these insects have a really essential function and they aren't going to get out of control and, and destroy your plants. They're going to be part of a healthy, sustainable ecosystem. The definition also refers to the physical environment. So that means the climate that we have in our area. That means the expected range of temperatures and rainfall patterns. The, storms we get. These are plants that have developed here over these thousands of years um, to withstand these types of conditions. Um, the soil conditions, which includes texture, whether it's sandy, whether it's clay, the pH levels, the soil depth, because that's something we often don't think about enough. Um, do we have really deep sandy soils? Um, are we gardening somewhere where we just have really shallow soils over a, a rock understory? Um, so those conditions are part of what these native plants have developed to withstand. And then other factors, such as if you're at the beach, salt spray, if you're in a floodplain, the flooding. So it's really important to um, look at the conditions that a plant is native to when you're trying to decide whether it will work in your yard. So what conditions did it develop under? And there's so many good things about natives, and there's so many reasons to plant them, and those essential relationships, you know, it's really important to support those, that sometimes people get really excited and over-promote native plants, so they try to sell them as a little more than what they are. And some of the most common things people do is um, they want to promote all natives, like natives are the only thing to plant anywhere. And that's not going to work because there's areas like parking lots that are not a native situation. Um, it's not where a lot of our native plants are going to thrive. And let's face it, you don't really want to be promoting wildlife to go into parking lots. So that's an area where we really need to stick to very, very tough um, adapted plants. Um, also, a lot of new construction areas, you know, the topsoil has been stripped away. These aren't the natural conditions. Um, areas may have been drained, so the hydrology is completely different. So the natural conditions aren't still intact like they were when the native vegetation was there. So natives aren't necessarily the choice for every planting situation. Um, just because something's native doesn't mean it's going to grow everywhere. A lot of our native plants are very specialized and adapted to specific habitats. 
um, things like the Venus flytrap, for example, here in the coastal plain. Very specialized conditions, which um, it would take a lot of trouble to create in your landscape. And the last thing about natives is they do require care. They're not just plant and forget. You do need to prepare the soil. You do need to take care of them. Um, and they will occasionally have some pest problems. So they're not just totally um, never do anything to them, which I, which I see promoted a lot. So you still have to um, go with the right plant for the right place, which is the foundation of choosing any plant. Um, so being familiar with your local plant communities and the growing conditions that exist in the wild where you are um, will help you choose plants that are suited to your yard. Um, so think about, is this a plant that grows in the woods? Does it grow out on the roadsides? Is it sun or shade? Um, does it grow where it's wet? Does it grow where it's dry? What are the soil conditions? And keeping in mind that those man-made conditions, like we have in most of our, our developments, um, are going to take some work to get them back to more of a natural style condition. So you're going to have to bring that organic matter back in and work it into the soil. Um, just when we're planting natives and we really want to get the most out of them, we want to support the most diverse range of species from pollinators to insects that are going to support birds and many other species. Um, plant a lot of different types of native plants. So as gardeners and master gardeners, that's not a hard thing to do. We want to plant a lot of different things. So make sure when you're choosing plants to try to find things that uh, bloom throughout the year. So you have several different things planted. You have a progression of blooms throughout the year. Um, you have both evergreen and deciduous plants, tall and short. So you want the canopy. You want the understory. You want the ground cover layer because different uh, species, different wildlife live in those different layers. So the more diversity you can have in your planting, the more diversity you'll have in uh, everything that lives in your yard. Um, and it's not you don't just want to go with one of this, one of that. You do want to plant in groups, um, particularly when we're thinking about pollinators foraging. This helps them to be a lot more efficient because they don't have to move so far from blossom to blossom. And uh, when they don't have to move as much, they're not as exposed to predators. So now I want to give a showcase of um, some great native plants for North Carolina landscapes. And I told Lucy this morning, I started off with 100 plants. So I knew I had to trim it down a whole lot. Um, so the, the parameters I used, I tried to choose plants that were native to at least a good part of the state, to at least two of the, our regions, if not all three. I went with plants that are available from nursery. So these are things that you could recommend to people. They should be able to find them to purchase. Now, not all of them are going to be available at every garden center or at Lowe's and Home Depot. Some of them, particularly some of the perennials, you'll have to go um, to some native plant nurseries. But there are um, more and more of those around that carry a wide range of plants. And these are plants that are adaptable to most landscapes, um, as long as you get them in the right place. So I didn't go with anything that was just super finicky in cultivation. And start off with, I just want to talk about um, some woody plants, some trees and shrubs. Um, now we live in the eastern deciduous forest. That's, that's what our overall ecosystem is. Um, and it's not surprising that many of our native trees and shrubs have become standard landscape plants, not, not just here in the United States or here in the eastern United States, but really around the world. Um, I lived in New Zealand for a while, and one of the biggest surprises to me there was uh, sweet gum was a favorite street tree. So it's uh, pretty interesting sometimes to see how our native plants are used in other areas. So trees and shrubs are a real essential part of a sustainable landscape. But you still have to go with right plant, right place. So red maple, very popular tree for shade tree, often planted as a street tree. But um, that's probably not the best place for it because red maple really needs moisture to do well. And we see a lot of red maple street trees failing because of gloomy scale. So stick with the right plant for the right place. Other of our native trees that we um, see so often in landscapes, you know, it's, they're just, you think of them more maybe as a landscape plant than specifically a native plant. Things like river birch, again, the red maple, many of our native oaks, um, the American holly, 
dogwood and redbud. So I'm not going to specifically talk about these, but that doesn't mean they're not wonderful plants. They're just things that most people are familiar with and can find pretty much everywhere. And I wanted to focus on maybe some of the slightly less well-known plants. So I want to start off with fringe tree, which is a native, uh, you can think of it as a large shrub, shrub or a small tree. Um, it actually grows throughout the state, but there are some differences in the populations. And in the coastal plain, um, the plants tend to be more shrub-like. And when you get into the Piedmont and the mountains, um, the, the genotype from that area tend to be more tree-like and actually are much faster growers. Um, I've grown both from seed, um, both um, French tree from the Piedmont source and from a coastal plain source. And the Piedmont plants definitely will naturally be more tree-like and grow much faster. And a lot of times when you have native plants that have a real wide range of places where they grow, a real wide geographic area, you will get these distinct differences from one area to another. And that's often re that's referred to as the genotype. So you could say the coastal plain genotype of fringe tree is more shrub-like. Um, and another word you'll sometimes hear referred to native plants that have distinct genotypes is talking about their provenance, where that particular form came from. So the fringe tree in this picture has a coastal plain provenance. So those are some terms you may run into from time to time. Um, but fringe tree, uh, whether you are growing it uh, from the Piedmont or the coastal plain genotypes, they do have these very attractive lacy flowers that come out typically uh, late April. And it is one of these plants that has separate male and female plants. The males have the showier flowers, but if you have a female, you get these beautiful purple fruits in late summer. They don't hang around long because the birds absolutely love them. Um, and of course, you have to have both male and female within reasonable distance of each other to get the fruit so that pollination can occur. Um, so this is a great shrub, particularly for moist soils. And you have to realize when I say moist, I'm coming from a coastal plain, coastal sandy soil situation. So moi any, any clay is going to be moist uh, in my reference when I say moist soil. Um, and in the wild, you'll find fringe tree growing in very, very wet areas that may have um, standing water for some period of time. Now, you will sometimes get some leaf spot late in the season, August, September, the leaves will be covered with brown spots. That's not going to hurt the tree. It's nothing you need to spray fungicides for. Just know that that's part of that plant's natural life cycle. Um, next is service berry or amelanchier. And we have several species in the state. Um, the two that tend to be more tree-like are Amelanchia arborea, which you find in the mountains in the Piedmont, and Amelanchia canadensis, which you find in the coastal plains in Piedmont. Um, and it's not unusual, again, to find different species of the same genus growing in different parts of the state. Um, this is a small tree, deciduous, that loses its leaves. It can have really nice fall color. Uh, and a lot of people know this um, or want to grow it because of the fruit that give it the name service berry. And the, the fruit are pretty tasty if you can get them from the birds. You can see in the picture they're uh, reddish and when they ripen they turn darker red. The flavor to me is somewhat of a cross between cherry and blueberry. Um, the seeds are a little bit gritty inside. Um, and it's not something you know, you're going to grow an orchard of. But it is an interesting thing to pick a few every now and again and eat. But again, the birds love it. And they are usually going to get to it way faster than you. But this is a tree that will grow in sun or part shade. Um, and as with most things that are adapted to both sun and part shade, the more shade it's in, the taller and more open the growth habit's going to be. And you're going to tend to have less flowers and fruit. But it still will survive there. Uh, it'll just be a little more open and uh, less flowers. Virginia sweet spire uh, is a well-known shrub. It's been in the nursery tray for a while now. It does grow across the state in wetlands here in the coastal plain. I see it in the wild in ditches of standing water. And it's been promoted both for the beautiful fall color, which to me is uh, actually its nicest attribute. Um, it does have white flowers in the spring. Usually here in the coastal plain, they open around Mother's Day, like little strings of pearls, the buds before they open. 
Um, and they last a few weeks. And it's a good shrub because it is tough. It's a great plant for rain gardens because it will take flooding. It'll take standing water. It does sucker, so it's one of these plants that will send shoots up from the roots. And you have to either plan for that by removing them if you want to keep it in a, in a small area or planting it somewhere that it can sucker over time. There's some different cultivars. Um, Henry's Garnet was one of the first. It's a bigger one. Little Henry is a, a smaller one. And there are some others that have come out as well that are, are smaller. But the one thing, if you've grown Virginia Sweet Spire, you've probably learned is the deer absolutely love it. Um, so that can be a problem in some neighborhoods. Um, next is Possum Hall Viburnum. And this is one of several native viburnums in the state. Uh, and this one grows throughout our state. Um, most of our others grow either in, in the eastern part or the western part. And this is another plant that, that in the wild tends to grow in wet areas. And you will notice a lot of our native plants that make it into cultivation are from wetter areas because they tend to do better in um, nursery containers. Uh, plants that come from really dry, sandy, well-drained soils are a little more finicky and a little tougher to grow. And that can be a barrier to them getting into the nursery trade and becoming available. So you'll see a lot of our uh, most available natives are from the wetter, wetter soil conditions. So possum hall viburnum uh, is an upright shrub, tends to usually be a little taller than it is wide. So another one with really, really nice fall color, red and burgundy, and, and beautiful berries in the fall. They start off pink and turn purple, as you can see in the picture, as they ripen. Um, like most viburnums, it will set fruit a lot better if there's multiple um, varieties in the landscape. So, you know, if nothing else, have several possum hall viburnums, but viburnums do seem to cross pollinate between species. So you could have more than one viburnum, and that would help all of them have a, a higher fruit load. Um, one thing about the possum hall viburnum is it is deciduous, but if you were to see it in the summer, you might think it's evergreen because it does have very thick, leathery leaves. And um, there are some varieties available you'll find, Winter and Brandywine. And these have been selected for nice berries, nice fall color. Another one for beautiful berries is American Beauty Berry. And I just don't think you can beat the color of these berries. You know, there's nothing else with this brilliant magenta um, color. And this is another shrub that grows throughout North Carolina. And pretty adaptable. It'll grow in shade or in sun. More sun, typically more berries. Um, I've seen some of them out in full sun where the, the stems just basically become solid berries. The clusters run into each other. There are so many. Um, one growing tip for this shrub is to cut it back every year, like you do at a butterfly bush. Um, if you don't, it will get open and lanky and pretty big. So every year, about this time of year, is perfect timing to go and cut it back to about uh, a foot tall, two foot tall from the ground, and let it grow out. It does bloom on new growth, so you're not going to affect the berries. And you'll keep it uh, vigorous and a little more compact that way. And uh, those berries start to ripen usually August, September. Sometimes they don't hang around long because the bird love, birds love those as well. The next shrub is um, not quite as familiar as some of the ones we've been talking about so far. It's called Hearts of Burston, or sometimes called Strawberry Bush. It is a native euonymus. So there's a lot of Asian euonymus that we grow in landscapes, but this one is actually native. Unfortunately, like all euonymus, deer love it. So that is something to be aware of um, with this plant specifically. In fact, it's used as an indicator species for deer populations in woodland areas. If there's a lot of uh, Euonymus americanus growing, we know the deer populations are fairly low. Um, but it is a, a really nice shrub. It's kind of unassuming. It's uh, deciduous, but it does have green stems. It's really adaptable to grow in sun or shade, and pretty adaptable to soil types. I actually think it looks better in the shade because it's a little more open. It tends to grow taller than it does wide. And it's not real thick and dense. So it's an interesting shrub to plant uh, more forward in an area. It, just because it's, it's relatively tall doesn't mean you have to put it at the back of a planting area. 
because it's it, it's open enough that you can see through and see what's around it and see through it. Um, and the most spectacular feature is in the fall, the seed pots that give it its common name, hearts are bursting or strawberry bush. Um, when the seed pots are closed, they look more like a strawberry. But then when you open up, you can see they do look like a heart that's burst open and has those red seeds dangling from the edge of the seed pod. Just wanted to include a couple of vines. Um, cross vine is one that, that grows throughout the state, typically in wetter areas. And it is a spring bloomer and a very vigorous climber. So it does need a pretty substantial structure to grow on. Um, it is a, a wonderful plant. You can see with that tubular red flower, hummingbirds love it. It's one of the, the, the ones they really go for, um, typically in May. Often in the wild, you don't see this. You don't notice it up in the trees, but you'll you'll be walking along and you'll see the blossoms laying on the ground, and then you look up and say, "Oh, look, it's a cross vine." Um, so it does tend to climb pretty vigorously, and um, if you cut through the roots, it will send up new shoots. It will suffer from the roots, so that's something to keep in mind as well when you plant it. It's not it's not a vine for a small confined space. Now you, you do sometimes find just the the wild form which is the red and yellow. But more often when you go to a nursery, what you find are one of the, the varieties, um, such as Miss Jekyll or Tangerine Beauty. In fact, Tangerine Beauty is probably more readily available than Miss Jekyll. Um, but these are, are both a, an apricot peach, kind of more of a solid colored variety. And there are some yellow ones. Uh, there's a solid yellow form. There's a solid, a more of a dark red form. So there are some different varieties out there if you get looking. But you can see this um, is at the JC, this top picture is at the JC Ralston Arboretum at the old Laugh House that used to um, be there. And so you can see that's an ideal type of structure for it to grow on. <clears throat> Something that's pretty large and sturdy so it can spread and really give you a spectacular display. And then coral honeysuckle. This one is more uh, Piedmont and coastal plains. So I don't think you find it so much in the mountains growing wild, but it's definitely hardy and can be grown um, in the mountains. And it's another spring bloomer. So both coral honeysuckle and cross vine are spring bloomers. If you needed to prune them, you would wait and do that, do that after they blossom. Because um, if you were to cut them back now, you would lose those spring flowers. Um, but coral honeysuckle, it, in my opinion, is one of our most spectacular um, native vines. Um, flower display, I've got several in my yard, and when they're in full bloom, typically in April and May, the blooms are just so heavy you can't see leaves or anything else. Uh, those are, are plants that are out pretty much in full sun. Um, it will grow in some shade, but you might not get quite as many flowers. Um, it's not quite as vigorous as cross vine. Um, I do have one of these on my mailbox and managed to keep it pruned. And my mail delivery person still delivers my mail and doesn't leave me ugly notes about it. So um, it can be kept in, in bounds um, with some pruning through the summer. Um, but it's really beautiful if you can let it grow and just grow out over, over some type of trellis and really let it um, make a, a nice display. Now, even though the main spring blooms, uh, or, or April, May time. This will continue to have flowers throughout the summer and into, I've seen it blooming right on up till Christmas here at the Coastal Plain. Uh, in fact, I've got some pictures I took at Carolina Beach State Park one year, December 22nd, of one growing in the wild and, and actually pretty much in, in full bloom. Um, so it will have sporadic flowering throughout, throughout the season. And again, those red tubular flowers, perfect for hummingbirds. And now I want to switch and talk about some of our native perennials, because we have so many wonderful native perennials in North Carolina. Um, now sometimes, you, especially in the, and I'm sure other areas too, but here in the coastal plain, you have to be a little judicious, because we can have some very vigorous native perennials that spread by seed or roots. Um, things like the wild ageratum, which I don't have a picture of here, but has the the flat purple flowers that bloom in the fall. You know, it's beautiful growing in the ditches and roadsides, but if you put it in your garden, it'll totally wrap up your whole yard. Um, 
So make sure you uh, do a little research on these plants before you plant them to, to ensure they're the right plant for what you're looking for. Um, on the whole, our native perennials aren't quite as well known as the woody plants um, and, and not quite as readily available. So you might have to go to specialty nurseries to find some of these. Um, although some of them, like the butterfly weed here in the picture and Joe Pye weed, are certainly um, very well known and very popular perennials. And also many of these flowering perennials, along with the, the flowering shrubs and trees, are great plants for pollinators. They're just excellent nectar sources. Because as you can see in the picture, a lot of our native perennials tend to have this flower structure where they have a lot of small flowers clustered together. So that gives you just multiple nectar sources all right there on one flower scape. And I have these arranged in order of bloom. So we're going through the season starting off in early spring, the eastern columbine, which is probably the whole reason I'm here talking to you today. The reason I'm a horticulturist is this plant, eastern columbine. Um, my grandmother had these in her garden. She was a naturalist, and she had collected some seed and, and scattered them around. And I just thought this was the most amazing plant when I was about uh, 11 years old. And so she gave me some seed, and I did, like she said, I scattered them around, and they didn't come up. And I thought, I'm gonna, I, I just want to have some of this plant. I think it's beautiful. I'm going to learn how to grow it. So I bought a book on seeds, and I bought... Um, a book on wildflowers, and things just progressed from there. So this is uh, definitely a native that's near and dear to my heart. And uh, a wonderful plant for gardens, uh, one of those early bloomers. It's one of the first things that usually blooms in my yard, um, typically in March and through April. And um, has these really fascinating flowers, these red and yellow flowers that, that hang down. And this is another one that hummingbirds will visit. Um, it is a plant that will grow in part shade, really, really heavy shade. It's not going to flower as well. Um, and it'll take sun as long as it has some moisture. Um, but you don't want this one to stay too wet because it'll rot in the summer if it stays too wet. Um, and a real trick or a real key to, to establishing this, and as well as our spring blooming plant, it's much better to plant them in the fall, especially the eastern columbine. If you plant them in the fall, they establish very well, and they're beautiful by springtime and come up in bloom. But if you try to plant them in the spring, you buy a plant when it's already in full bloom, that plant's putting so much energy into blooming, um, it's not going to put in a lot of root growth. Plus, eastern columbine is a cooler weather plant, and it doesn't do a lot of active growing as you go, in, as you go into summer. So you plant it in spring, and it just kind of sits there all summer. It tends to increase the chances it might rot. So this is a great one either to get some seed and uh, start them in the fall, or to try to get those plants in the fall. Next is green and gold. And I've never understood why this plant doesn't become more popular. It's just so, to me, it's just so cheerful. It's one of those first things to bloom in spring in my yard. Um, it is a Piedmont native. And uh, I have found it in some coastal plain counties. And um, I have seen it at Lowe's and Home Depot. I've seen it at garden centers. And people just walk right by it, even when it's in full bloom. And I, I just don't understand it, because I just think it has such a beautiful, simple charm. It's a low grower. You know, it's giving you early color. And also, with these early blooming flowers are really important for pollinators. Um, because there's so much in bloom later in the spring and through the summer. But it's really the earliest things to bloom and the latest things to bloom that can be really critical for pollinators because it gives them uh, those nectar sources early and late in the season. So green and gold makes a wonderful little ground cover plant because it is evergreen. So um, that's an added value in addition to the flowers um, is to have something low growing that's evergreen. We don't have a lot of natives that make good ground covers, but this one is a good one for part shade um, and moisture well-drained soil. Next is Blue Star or Amsonia, Tabor Renee Montana. Um, many of you probably are, are, have grown Arkansas Blue Star, which is Amsonia hubrichtii, wonderful plant, very similar but with very narrow leaves. Um, it's more, of course, as the name implies, it's native out in Arkansas. But we do have this species native throughout North Carolina. And um, the first one I ever found growing wild here in the coastal plain 
was growing under a bridge and it was growing on a creek bank that part of the year it would be totally submerged in water and then as the creek levels went down it would be above the water and then occasionally if it rained a lot it would be flooded for a little while. So this was a, a super tough plant. And even though it was living under a bridge it is not a troll. So this is a great plant for your garden. Again for some early color, one of the first perennials to bloom typically in April um, here at the Coastal Plain and these beautiful clusters of icy blue flowers. And they bloom for about three weeks and you get butterflies visiting them. And I really like the foliage. Um, over the summer the foliage just stays really clean, just a nice green background to other plants. And then it turns yellow in the fall, yellow and gold. So it's one of the, the very few perennials that has really nice um, fall color. And, and sun or shade, if it's in more sun it does need more moisture. And um, Great one for rain gardens though. So it's it's a good rain garden plant because it'll take that vacillating between flooding and, and being a little on the drier side. Carolina phlox. This is still we're still kind of in our, our spring bloomers moving towards mid to, to later in the spring. Um, and this is one of several native phlox um, that we have in North Carolina. But Carolina phlox is um, kind of a medium height, a foot to a foot and a half. So a lot of our native flocks are real low growers. And uh, typical wild form is this magenta pink flower. And there's some um, selective varieties that have white flowers or, or different variations on pink. Um, but it's another one that, it, you know, like all of the flocks, they're great um, nectar plants, great for pollinators. And it is fragrant, like most all of our flocks particularly the taller types of flocks are fragrant. Um, and just a tough plant and a good performer. The partridge berry, I didn't know whether I stuck it, <coughs> excuse me, I put it here in the spring plants, <coughs> excuse me, because that's when it blooms. Um, but the most notable feature most people talk about are the berries, which are um, bright red and they start to turn color in the fall and persist during the winter. Um, and this is another one of those um, great ground cover plants which are uncommon among our natives. A lot of our natives want to grow up a little taller. So this is a good one if you're looking for a ground cover for shade. It does need part shade to full shade and um, moist or well drained soil and, uh, and it is evergreen. So it's a great plant for very, very low growing, very low mat and you'll get the flowers in the spring. A lot of people don't realize the flowers are actually really fragrant, but you have to get on your hands and knees to smell them. And the only reason I realized it is because I happened to be walking through a um, fire cut in a forest one time. So I was about four feet below, walking down in this trench, I was about four feet below the ground level and the sides were totally covered with partridge berry and I just kept smelling something. It smelled so wonderful, I couldn't imagine what it was. And finally I realized it was the partridge berry and when I, when I got closer I could really tell. Um, so fragrant when smelled close up and uh, great low growing ground cover and beautiful berries. Another one um, that is an evergreen and does work well as a ground cover is this plant um, known as the plantum leaved pussy toes. And it gets that, that common name because the flowers, which you can't see super clear in this picture, but the flowers look just like a kitten's toes. And you want to rub them and pet them. And that's a perfect thing to do because they're nice and furry. So it's a fun plant to, um, to look at with kids when it's in bloom in the, in the mid to late spring. Um, but it's a real functional plant because it gives you these beautiful gray green leaves that stay evergreen and have this really nice texture the way they come out they're kind of curled up um, and I love the texture of the leaves on the ground. Um, and it's also the larval host for American Painted Ladies so you will notice it later in the spring and in the summer that some of those gray green leaves will start to get rolled up and webbed and um, may turn a little bit brown. But that's okay because if you look inside you'll find one of the caterpillars that will become an American Painted Lady. So it's a, a wonderful plant for um, butterfly gardens to show the um, larval host foods. Another one, the classic probably everybody would include in a butterfly garden is butterfly weed. Um, it's a species of Asclepias and we actually have several um, 
species of Asclepias in North Carolina. This is the most well known and the one that grows throughout the state. Um, bright orange flowers in the late spring and early summer. So very, very noticeable when it's in bloom. And it tends to have two distinct blooms. Or here in the coastal plain it does. Um, you'll have an early flush of flowers in uh, May. And then you'll have a second set of flowers in June. And um, in really good garden conditions, I think you can get it to flower more. But in the wild, you'll see those two, two flushes of flowers. Um, but this, this is, along with all Asclepia species, are the larval hosts for monarchs, which we see the caterpillar here and the chrysalis. Um, so this is one you definitely want to have in the butterfly garden. Um, and also, the, just many different species of adult butterflies will feed on the flowers. And you'll get lots of beneficial insects attracted as well. Uh, you know, butterfly weed can really become its own ecosystem in the number of different insects that will visit it. It's a fascinating plant. Uh, to have in the garden. And this, um, the orange butterfly weed, is one for drier or, or well-drained soils and sun. But if you have wet areas, um, I would strongly recommend the swamp milkweed or just, uh, uh, you know, it'll grow fine in clay soil as well. Um, swamp milkweed is native to most of our state. It doesn't occur in the wild here in my area, but um, it grows just fine. And it is a beautiful plant um, with pink flowers clusters of pink flowers. It's more upright than the butterfly weed, um, and it does need that moisture. And it blooms all summer. It'll keep having recurrent flushes of, of blossoms throughout the summer. Um, and I've even seen them in, in bloom in the fall when it was planted in wetlands, um, where it's at the edge of a pond. It loves that type of situation. Um, or just a, a good or, a soil with a lot of organic matter or clay. And also, you'll get the monarchs visiting it as well. The absolute number one plant, though, for pollinators has to be mountain mint. And even though it's called mountain mint, these plants grow across the state. And there are several different species. Um, the flowers themselves are nice. They're not outstanding. But the value in this plant is the company it keeps. It is just a treasure trove of pollinators. It's fascinating to watch how many different species will visit this plant when it's in flower. Um, my favorite species uh, is the um, Pycnanthemum tenufolium, which is pictured up at the top. It's a very narrow-leafed species. And it has these little bitty white flowers. Um, and it's nice. It stays in place, even though the name mountain mint might think you might make you think of something that spread. And some species do spread. The Pycnanthemum tenufolium, in my garden anyway, stays in a nice clump. And I love the texture. And in the winter, it's really beautiful. I don't have a picture of it in winter, but it, the, the flower heads turn kind of gray, and the leaves stay on. And there's just something about its appearance in winter, even though it's totally dormant, um, that I just really like. Um, most people will go for the hoary mountain mint, which is the Pycnanthemum and canum. It has showier flowers, but it is more of a spreader. So you do have to be aware of that. Beautiful flowers, but more of a spreader. But I really, really encourage everybody to include at least one species of Pycnanthemum in their garden. You are probably going to have to go to a native plant nursery to find these. Joe Pyweed. Um, one of our well, you know, better known native perennials, um, very popular, and um, recently had a name change. You might be familiar with it as Eupatorium, and now and it was briefly Eupatorial delphis, and now it's Eutrochium. So, but you'll still see a lot of references to it as just Eupatorium. And again, several species in the state which have these very similar rosy mauve flowers in the late summer. Here in the coastal plain and, and also extending to the Piedmont, we have what's called the coastal plain Joe Pieweed, the Eutrochium dubium, um, which in the coastal plain I highly recommend. It's a wonderful species. It's only about five feet tall, um, which is much shorter than Eupatorium fistulosum, which is seven and eight feet tall. And um, a great plant for butterflies, all of the Eupatoriums are. If you're in the mountains, you're probably going to look at growing Eupatorium purpureum or maculatum, although you can grow Eupatorium dubium as well. Um, Eupatorium maculatum particularly is strictly a mountain species, so it doesn't tend to do as well here at the coastal plain. So you do want to pay attention to where you are and which species you get. Um, for Eupatorium dubium, there is a variety called Little Joe, 
which is available in the trade. Um, it's called Little Joe because it's supposed to be shorter, but um, it's really not that much shorter than the plain species. Um, and it's a good plant, and uh, just but it's, I just haven't seen a significant difference between it and just the plain the plain species that grows in ditches throughout the throughout the area. A great companion for um, Joe Pye weed is the rough stem goldenrod. We have tons of native goldenrods. Some are pretty vigorous spreaders, so you do have to be careful or be selective and know your plant when you're going to put it in the garden. And, and if it's one of the, the real spreading type, give it lots of space. Give it a, a natural area to, to, uh, to cover. Um, one of the, the real misconceptions about goldenrod is it's a major contributor to hay fever. And certainly people may be allergic to goldenrod, but it, goldenrod doesn't have a real light pollen that floats on the air. Um, the plants that have really um, light pollen tend to be the wind pollinated plants, uh, like in the spring, the pine trees, the oak trees. Um, in the fall, goldenrod tends to always bloom at the same time as, and I, every time I want to call the name of this weed, I forget it, um, the main weed that causes so much hay fever in the fall. If somebody could think of it, put it in the chat box. But uh, the weed that causes so much hay fever in the fall has little tiny flowers, and you can't even notice them. And um, it is the one that's causing everybody to sneeze, but it happens to bloom at the same time that goldenrod starts to bloom. And so goldenrod gets the blame for it. So don't be afraid to plant it in your garden thinking it's going to cause a lot of allergies. Um, and again, like the milkweed, this plant is an ecosystem into itself in the number of pollinators and beneficial insects and just fascinating. Uh, creatures that come and visit it. It's just a wonderful plant to watch and beautiful flowers. And, and it comes out and looks really fresh at a time when most other things are looking pretty sad. So late August, early September time frame. Just going to finish up with a couple of grasses. Um, pink mully grass. This is more of a coastal plain Piedmont plant, but it, it does grow into the mountains, I think particularly the lower elevations. And um, beautiful ornamental grass. DOTs really elevated this plant. Um, it was totally unknown until they started planting it on the overpasses. And now everybody loves it. Everybody has it. And uh, for those those fall flowers, you know, the rest of the year it doesn't look like much. Just a, a little low, a low growing mound of grass. Um, the one thing about mully grass is it is. Um, semi-evergreen. It doesn't go completely dormant. It doesn't turn completely brown like a lot of ornamental grasses. It stays half green, half brown. You're not sure what to do with it in the winter. But it really is going to perform best over the long run if you cut it back in the winter. So even though it still has some live leaves, go ahead this time of the year um, as soon as possible before any new growth begins and cut it back to uh, kind of as low as you can get back down to the, the crown of the plant. And this is just a super tough one. Um, if you're at the beach, it grows very well. It's drought tolerant. It does need to be out in the sun. It will not do well in the shade. And like all of our ornamental grasses, the deer don't like to eat it. So that's always a bonus. And then the last one is panic grass or switchgrass, the panicums. Um, this is one that's native to most of the eastern half of the United States. It has a very, very large uh, native range. There are a lot of selections available. One of my favorite is North Wind, which is in the picture here. It's a, a nice, tight, upright one that gets about four feet tall. There's an enormous one called Cloud Nine that gets eight feet tall. And a newer one called Prairie Fire, which is only about three, fire, three feet tall, but it has nice um, burgundy foliage. So that's one definitely to look out for. And these are, are pretty adaptable grasses. Moisture, dry soil, sun to light shade. More sun is better. It's going to stand up better. It's another good one that does well in rain gardens. Um, and another, you know, it turns completely brown in the winter, but it looks, it's kind of a golden color. It looks really nice in the winter. But you want to make sure this time of year to go ahead and cut it back. And there are many, many natives. I'm sure I've left many of your favorites out. I've left many of my favorites out. So the good news is you can explore more native plants, um, both on the, the Extension Plants database as well as the Going Native website, um, which is also an Extension website. And the Going Native website includes lots of information about designing for wildlife and creating a um, wildlife-friendly landscape. If you've not ever checked either of those websites 
sites out. Those are great resources. I've listed some books, um, which I highly recommend. This, the first one, Native Plants of the Southeast, just came out. And um, it's 460 of the best plants from the Southeast for, for your garden. So um, pretty extensive coverage of many of our wonderful natives. Um, the Best Native Plants for Southern Gardens by Gil Nelson is also a great book. Um, and it's just come out in the last few years. Gardening with Native Plants of the South has been out for several years, but a really good reference. Organized by trees, shrubs, perennials, so it's a real easy one to, to find uh, a plant for a specific situation you're looking for. Then, of course, Bringing Nature Home by Douglas Tallamy. And I didn't list his new book because it won't be out until June, but it's called um, The Living Landscape. And it's going to be co-authored with Rick Dark, and I'm sure it will be fabulous. There's also the North Carolina Botanical Gardens in Chapel Hill, which is uh, dedicated to um, studying and promoting native plants. They have different habitat gardens. So if you visit, they have a coastal plain garden, a Piedmont garden, a mountain garden and um, lots of information on their website. Of course, there's many other great public gardens across the state and our state parks where you can learn a lot about native plants. Each year, there is the Colorful Native Plant Conference held in Western Carolina, which is the official gathering for all native plant enthusiasts. And they have education um, and tours and lots of interesting things. Oops, I'm sorry. So that's the end. And um, I think I have just a few minutes for questions. Anybody wants to jump in? Oh, ragweed, thank you. I see several people. <laughs> and it, I, it never, ever fails when I start to talk about uh, goldenrod, as I'm trying to say the word ragweed, it totally disappears from my mind. So thank you all for <laughs> including that in. Ragweed is the one that causes so much hay fever in the, the fall. OK, there was a question about any of the plants being poisonous to the point where you don't want to use around children. Um, not that I know of, um, but there, you can always check that out on, um, there is the plants poisonous to people section uh, on the, it is included in the plants database actually. I think one of the choices is to search for poisonous plants. Um, yes, I see it there. So you can double check things there. Um, then there is also the plants poisonous to pets and livestock. If, you know, I actually get more questions about is it poisonous to livestock or specifically is it going to be poisonous to my cat or dog. And you can check that out. That's another NC State website if you just Google NCSU plants poisonous to pets and livestock. Uh, and uh, I've got a question about the slides. I'm more than happy to share the slides. Um, and I believe they, that Lucy does post those PowerPoints on the Plants, Pests, and Pathogens website. So it, it might end up being posted there. But if you want me to send it to you directly, you can just send me an email at charlotte underscore glenn at ncsu.edu. Yeah, they're, they're posted in a place that, that agents have access to them. But, but if master gardeners are asking, they would want to ask you directly. OK, yes, yes. Um, so Lucy's asked about the pros and cons of cultivated varieties of native plants. Um, well, and I did mention several cultivars. So those are selected varieties that are being propagated by cuttings. So you're losing some of that diversity when you have a cultivar because you're, all of those plants are going to be genetically identical. Um, and so that, that's a con from a wildlife standpoint. You aren't having the greatest range of diversity. But it is still a plant that our native insects are adapted to feed because plants just have unbelievable uh, natural defense systems and chemicals that they produce within themselves that only certain insects have been able to adapt to feed on. And that's why everything in the woods doesn't get eaten up because these plants are defending themselves. So even though it's a cultivar, it still you know, is part of that um, genetic uh, makeup of that, that genus and species. 
So um, cultivars tend to make it more into the nursery trade because they have some spectacular feature sometimes, most of the time. And it's easier to promote, and, and it gives you a more reliable performance. So from a landscaping standpoint, we usually tend to prefer cultivars, especially if you're going to plant a, a group of them and you need them to be fairly similar. From a recreating an ecosystem and, say, restoring a habitat, if you're going to go in and restore a wetland, then you don't want to use the cultivars. You want to try to find native wild uh, Stock, or not, the, not, not from the wild, but you want to try to find nurseries that are growing plants from seeds collected from the wild, and so you have that full range of diversity. So landscaping standpoint, we're usually looking more at the cultivars. It is going to reduce the, the benefit a little bit, um, but I haven't seen any direct research you know, to say this is not the way to go. Um, and from a recreating an ecosystem, you want to try to get local genotypes that are being propagated from local seed sources and go with that seed grown plants. And if anybody has anything to add to that, you're welcome to to share more comments on that topic. Charlotte, thanks so much. Is it Wonderful presentation. Really appreciate your, your sharing all that. Charlotte has just um, written a new chapter for the Extension Master Gardener Manual on native plants. So much of this information will be in, included in that, and it will become a core part of the training that we do. So thank you for leading the way on that, Charlotte. All right. I enjoyed it. Next up, we have Mark Blevins with our showstopper plants. Hola, señores y señoritas. Bienvenidos to the showstopper portion of the Plants, Pests, and Pathogens seminar. You may notice a slight accent, and that is because today we will talk about a Mexican native shrub, the Aztec fighter Elicio Mexicano, the Anis. I have a cousin named Dennis and Denise, which rhyme, but they are not listening. So let me tell something to you about this evergreen and ever beautiful plant. All anise plants smell wonderful, like me, and licorice. They can tolerate full sun, like me, but their deepest and richest color comes when nurtured in shady places. They also have well-known cousins from Florida, also like me. The difference in Elysio Mexicanum in general, and Aztec fire specifically, with all the other anises, is that these flowers are burgundy in color, e bigger, E on longer pedoncles. That is the thing that the plant attaches to the flower and the flower to the plant. Hey, Mr. Durr says that you should definitely try this out in zones Siete to Nueve. <laughs> Check out this and other showstopper plants here. Do, do, do. E, give Juan Binding a huge hug the next time you see him for leading this statewide program which brings together nurserymen and extension agents to select the top-notch plants for your little piece of Carolina del Norte. And that's it from the Showstopper Plants today. Gracias, Lucy. Okay. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, all right, I guess uh, I'll start now. Um, today we're going to be talking about some insects, some interesting insects, and uh, groups of other arthropods. Um, first, I'd like to start out with uh, an interesting sample we got into the clinic in December. Um, so this is the common hazel filbert, or sometimes the European filbert, uh, Corylus avalana. And uh, here you see a mature plant, and uh, these are some of the some coralist species are native and found just out in the wild. Uh, but people are planting these sometimes for the nuts, but also apparently to grow truffles on the roots. Um, this sample came in from Bladen County, and uh, there was a strange phenomenon going on. There were uh, holes in uh, the major branches of the uh, plant, and uh, also some some uh, basically some pellets on the ground, uh, little little uh, elongate 
pellets looking almost like sawdust. And you can see the size reference with a penny right here. Uh, so they, uh, the agent isolated a caterpillar from inside the log and sent me some pictures. And they were a little clear. So I had him send the specimen. And it turned out to be a very interesting thing. It turned out to be the pecan carpenter worm. Uh, this is a member of the family Cossidae, or the carpenter moths. Uh, and the species is Cosula magnifica. Now, this is the only species in the genus in North America. It ranges all the way down to Guatemala. Uh, but in North America, it's present in the southeast, basically the Gulf states, from North Carolina south to Florida and west to Texas. Um, now, its typical hosts are going to be hickory and pecan, so carrier species. Uh, but also, it's been found in oak and persimmon. Now, this is odd because uh, Coralus is not normally listed, and I have not seen any reference to this. So this may actually be a new host record for this caterpillar. Um, so I'm going to look into that and maybe make a, a, a note about this somewhere, uh, just so people are aware that this species can infest uh, Coralus. So here we see the, uh, the larva. It's uh, got this large pronotum, this large thorax with these spines kind of on the top. Uh, and here's what the adult looks like. It's one of the um, more uh, stick mimicking uh, moths. If this were resting on a branch, it would look like the bark here, typical bark, and then a cut off as if the branch was broken. So very well camouflaged. The adults don't come to lights and don't come to sugaring baits. So they're only randomly seen. Uh, you have to kind of uh, happen upon them. They're also not very locally, uh, they're not very abundant all over. There are not many specimens, uh, not many photos online. I actually, uh, on Bug Guide, the site that I use a lot, uh, put the first photos of the larvae. And, um, but they can be locally abundant, especially when you're planting stands of these trees, like pecans and hickories, uh, that attract these moths. So um, here, the life cycle is the eggs are laid on twigs in the spring. And these are the very small twigs. And the larvae bore into them and eat out the entire pith. Now, when they start to grow and be the space becomes a little tight, They'll actually leave those little twigs and then go into the larger branches or the trunk of the trees. Now, of course, uh, uh, hazel is a little bit different than other types of woody plants. Instead of like the pecans and hippories and oaks that have a large trunk, these have multiple smaller stems coming from the ground. Uh, so in this case, the damage is being done to these uh, portions of the stem that were about two to three inches in diameter. Uh, so in the fall, that's when they actually enter these larger branches and the tr trunks of the trees. And then they overwinter and emerge as adults in the spring and summer from April to June. So you can see here the size reference. Here's a pencil. So they're not a small caterpillar. They're about an inch long. And uh, they make fairly large tunnels. Now, luckily, they burrow pretty quickly into the heartwood, so they're not going to be affecting the vascular system very much. Um, but as you'll see, they may, may cause some troubles. So what can you do, and what do they do? So they don't directly kill the trees, uh, but they can weaken the, the wood. So if there's a lot of damage inside, if there's a uh, an ice storm or wind or things like that, it can actually cause structural damage and, uh, and um, weaken the plant. Uh, they can also damage timber. Uh, so um, if you're harvesting these types of woods for making uh, timber and, and uh, actual wood uh, to sell, it's uh, going to have tunnels and holes in it. It also may allow for pathogens to enter the tree. Um, so some things to do are to keep the trees healthy. So as you can see here, this site is where it looks like it was pruned. There's some rough bark. It looks like there was a canker or something here. And this is a nice site for them to come into the wood. 
Um, so this may help promote infestation if you have these wounds or, or pruning sites. So keeping the trees healthy is, is a good way to help. Uh, I have a question in the chat box. Yes, yes, I see. Okay. Um, and so this is, this is the best practice to avoid this caterpillar to clean under trees of sticks and holes in fall and winter. Um, so they are not going to be in there. They're actually going to be in the trunk of the tree during the fall and winter. So they don't actually, uh, they're going to be in the tree or the bush the entire time. Um, so basically, um, if these are in this landscape where they're isolated plants, they're not likely to get a lot of these. It's when you start to plant them, um, cultivate them in, in large numbers that you may get these, uh, these uh, caterpillars coming in. Um, so one suggestion, though chemical control is not likely needed all the time, uh, one suggestion by our, one of our entomologists who's retired, Jim Baker, said that perhaps spraying in uh, the spring when the adults are out laying eggs, perhaps spraying some pyrethroids on the smaller twigs and branches might keep the caterpillars from entering those initial twigs and then subsequently entering the, the trunks and the larger branches later on in the fall. Um, but uh, basically, um, yeah, the sticks on the ground, anything that goes to the ground is going to be, is not going to have any of these insects in them. They're going to be in the tree the entire time. And it is kind of odd that they actually come out of the smaller twigs and go to the larger branches and trunks um, in that most of the borers are not going to leave the tree and then re-enter it. So you may see entry holes and you may see um, some exit holes from the twigs. But it's just an interesting sample of an uh, insect that I was not very familiar with and that even Dave Steffen before, he was very surprised and he was excited about this uh, sample. And it's, it's very interesting. And so we'll have to see how this plays out and uh, how many trees and how many of these hazels are, are affected in the years to come. Okay. So um, I'm going to do a two-part special. Uh, today I'll be talking about the first part, and sometime in this next year I'll be talking about the second part, about magnificent myriapods. So myriapod is a technical term for a major lineage of arthropods in the subphylum myriapoda. And they're known for their long legs, uh, long bodies with many legs. And they're actually the oldest land animals known. There's a fossil from 428 million years ago of a millipede. Uh, and so it came, on the, it, it came on the land and was all alone with the plants and having fun until other things came uh, to eat it and, do, and uh, fill other niches in the environment. Uh, here we see one of the oldest millipedes and actually the largest ever arthropod on land. And there's an eight foot long millipede where they found tracks of this millipede and fossils of the actual millipede. And it was about 300 million years ago that this was roaming the earth. So again, it was an herbivore, so we probably wouldn't have been too scared of it, but it was a very large organism. Now, there are four major groups of myriapods. We've got the millipedes, the centipedes, the symphylons, and the poropods. So most of you have probably heard of millipedes and centipedes. Uh, but uh, symphylons and poropods are very small relatives of those two groups. Uh, both groups have uh, mostly live in uh, soil, in, uh, in the litter, and in the, between the soil particles, and are very pale millipede or centipede-like creatures. Again, they have multiple legs. Uh, now, symphylons or garden centipedes are probably more well-known just because some of them can be agricultural pests where they can, uh, and they're sometimes called greenhouse centipedes, because they will attack some herbaceous plants um, and reduce yield. Poropods, on the other hand, are not very common. They don't do much other than eat detritus and fungus, things like that. Um, so if you're digging around the soil, you might find some of these little pale centipedes or some of these little pale poropods, um, and uh, you might notice them. But uh, the, one, the things you're going to notice more are the millipedes and centipedes. So for today, I'm going to talk about centipedes. Uh, they're, it's a little less talked about because they're a little less diverse than millipedes. 
there are about um, 3,000 species, I think, of centipedes described. And they are in the class Chilopoda. Now, all of them are predatory and venomous. Um, now, unlike their millipede relatives, they have one pair of legs per segment. So here you see the one leg you know, on each side of each segment. And the first pair of legs is actually developed into fang-like structures called forcipules. Uh, so these, though they look like fangs, like on a spider or a snake, uh, these are actually the front legs that are heavily armed and have this very sharp tip and can deliver venom. So because they're venomous, some of the larger ones can actually bite people if you're not careful and can deliver venom. Now, they are not known to be deadly. There's one report of uh, a death that's uh, kind of not, and this was in Southeast Asia with a law, very large centipede, but it's unsubstantiated and there's really no evidence that that was really the case. So they can, some of the larger tropical ones can bite and cause uh, sickness or anaphylaxis, things like that, but their venom directly won't kill you. And around here, we really don't have many species that are dangerous. Um, but I'll get to that in a few minutes. Okay, so centipedes have an interesting life cycle. Uh, the males lay spermatophores, these little sperm packets all around, where the females then walk around and they pick them up. Uh, the female often guards and cleans the eggs. Uh, the eggs are susceptible to fungus, and so they guard the eggs and keep them safe. And you can see here, this is a really great picture of them starting to develop outside the egg and the female is sitting there with them. Now the young will stay with the mother. If they stay too long, they may be eaten by the mother. But there are some species that actually the, the mother will die and get eaten by the babies to give them their first kind of meal. So it can go either way. Um, now there's two different methods of growth in centipedes. Some will add segments during their life. So they'll start out with few segments and then gain them as they grow older into a certain point when they reach sexual maturity. Others are born with all the segments they're ever going to have. Um, so those are the two ways they grow. So some kinds of centipedes. So I'm sure many people are familiar with and very uh, freaked out or grossed out by house centipedes. These are the sister group or the relatives of all the other centipedes. Um, they're extremely fast. Here's an immature. It has uh, fewer segments than the adult will have. Um, they're very fast predators, long legs, long antennae. And uh, unlike other centipedes, they retain compound eyes like insects have. They're vi visual hunters. They're going to run around. And they live in homes and particularly like to eat flies and cockroaches and things like that. So they're actually a beneficial arthropod in the home, despite the fact that they are scary looking and could, larger ones, if they're harassed, could potentially bite. Um, but they're generally good guys in the home. They're going to be predators eating pests. OK, uh, common centipedes that most people uh, uncover when they're lifting up uh, bricks or looking uh, in the garden are going to be the stone centipedes. These are the reddish, brick red centipedes. They have 15 segments. And uh, ju just general centipedes that are in the, in the on the ground, um, they're going to be predatory on small arthropods. OK, then the Scolopendromorpha. The, this is a large group of centipedes. They're called, referred to as tropical centipedes because many of the large, really brightly colored, pretty ones are found in the tropics. But we have plenty of our own here. Um, so this one right here is the Florida blue centipede. This is our largest centipede that we have in North Carolina. It gets about three or so inches long. And it has been known to enter homes, and there are some really scary reports of them biting people. But in general, uh, they're going to be out in the woods under logs, under the bark of logs, like this one was found in Garner. Um, and uh, they're generally not, they come into homes when they bump into a house on their, on their travels and happen to get inside. Now when they do get inside, they don't survive very long because they need a lot of moisture uh, to survive. And so you'll oftentimes find them dead if you do find them in your home. 
Uh, here's another type of uh, scolopendromorph centipede. It's a very much smaller one. But we are familiar also, especially in the lab, with some of the larger ones. This is Natalie, our lab's uh, seven inch scolopendrous subspinopes. Uh, this is a very uh, large Southeast Asian uh, centipede. Now we do get ones this large out in the Midwest down to the Southwest uh, that are even more beautiful than this one actually. And these are the ones that can give a fairly dangerous bite. Um, they're very aggressive. Uh, they will eat uh, small animals uh, including rodents and lizards and snakes and things like that. Uh, very aggressive, very scary, but also good mothers and um, very interesting organisms. Now the last one, the last group of centipedes are the soil centipedes. These are the geophilomorpha. Um, these are the very elongate, thin, and many-legged centipedes that you often find under, under bark, under rocks, in your soil, in the garden. Uh, you can actually see this one is showing its forcipules right here coming out in front of the head. Uh, they're basically harmless because they're very tiny. Though this picture makes it look large. This specimen was only about an, two inches long and very, very thin. Um, but again, very important um, predators in the soil. Now some of these are actually specialized uh, prey of ants and certain other groups of, of organisms. And many centipedes do get eaten by other organisms like spiders and scorpions and birds, all different things. Okay, so just some centipede facts. Uh, they live in various environments from arid regions to tropical rainforests. Uh, the smallest are about 12 millimeters long and the largest are about 12 inches long. Some, some reported to be about 13 inches long. You can see this uh, man holding a very large specimen right there. And actually I'm going to post a link right now um, into, the, into the chat. And uh, this is actually one of the large centipede, a video of one of the large centipedes catching and eating bats in Venezuela. So it's a really amazing video from Life in the Undergrowth with David Attenborough. Uh, well, even though they are scary and you think they might eat us, the fact is that many people, especially in Asia, like to eat these large centipedes as well. So you see a centipede on a stick. Uh, it may be more for tourists, but I'm not sure. Uh, there seem to be plenty of pictures online of them, and I'm sure, and there are pictures online of people eating them. I'm not sure how they taste, uh, but uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to find out. And uh, some of them, although they're called centipede, which means 100 legs, uh, some of them have over 300 legs. Now this is less than millipedes, the most of the millipedes have, uh, but it's still a fair number of legs. And uh, so um, next time, at, so at some point this year, I will cover millipedes, which are a much more diverse uh, group, um, and uh, we'll just uh, have to get to it then. Okay. Now to wrap up, um, we're going to have the be on the lookout for March and April. So one of the things is our friend, the fall canker worm, uh, Alcephila palmitaria. These are, there was a lot of activity. I saw a lot of male fall canker worms and some females, these wingless females on buildings. Uh, this is probably not a good sign because that means there are probably a lot of eggs and then there are probably going to be a lot of these green larvae again eating up our trees, defoliating the leaves and dropping down. Uh, along with the fall, fall canker worms, there's going to be lots of other types of caterpillars. Some that look very similar, uh, others that are a little less green, maybe some other colors that are going to be waking up. Either they've been around in the winter and slowly growing or they're going to hatch and start to climb up the trees and start to eat the foliage. So be on the lookout for caterpillars. Also, uh, scales and some aphids are going to start to become active. Uh, the scales, especially the young that were overwintering, are going to become active on the plants, settle, and turn into these large females, uh, and then begin to feed and lay eggs. Um, and uh, so be on the lookout for them. The uh, the Older females are not very easy to treat, so you want to look out for plants that have a lot of the crawlers and that crawling stage. 
Now, other types of scales, like the armored scales, are going to be reproducing throughout the year, so it's not as seasonal as these soft scales, these large, uh, kind of bulbous ones without a covering. And lastly, um, just be on lookout for everything else that's waking up from the long, cold winter. So kudzu bugs that were overwintering are probably going to become common and get on all the plants around. They may be feeding on some of these plants just facultatively until their hosts like kudzu and wisteria and soybean are start to become active and produce uh, pods. Also, some of the solitary bees and things like that will start coming out of the ground and foraging. If anything's blooming right now, you might be able to observe some of the bees going around. And with that, we will move on to our next segment. Okay, it's time for our uh, critter or not segment. Uh, we did this last year and uh, got fairly good response about it. And so we decided to pull a lot of things we found over the winter that came into the clinic and, uh, and uh, give a nice uh, quiz to everybody. Now, if you can see the slide sorter, don't go into there. Uh, <laughs> there, are some, uh, there are some answers in there. And we wouldn't want anybody to cheat themselves out of a great quiz experience by doing that. So um, what we're going to do this time to keep it a little more anonymous is if you, you can use whatever symbol you want, uh, but if you think this is a critter, the thing is caused by a critter or is a critter, either an insect, mite, spider, mollusk, or vertebrate, click on the check one. Click whatever symbol you want on the check one. If you think this is something else, like a disease, fungus, abiotic problem, or whatever, you can click on the X. So everybody want to practice? You having a good day or bad day? Click on the check or the X. I'm having a good day. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. OK. So now we kind of know how to play. So I'm going to click to the next slide, and we're going to have Mike introduce the first one. All right. I hope everyone can hear me. Good morning to all. This particular object or material was found on the branch of a street tree, a yard tree, possibly a Zelkova in Wake County just this past weekend. What do you think? Critter or not? Looks like everyone, now, now remember, by the way, we should mention that uh, we want you to keep track here of your scores so that you can see how well you did at the end. And also, if you're in a group, please designate somebody as the secretary to be able to take a consensus and then mark the, mark the slide. It looks like everyone's on board here with the idea that this, in fact, is a critter. It is the empty cocoon of a polyphemus moth. I'll have to have help from an entomologist here, Anthuria polyphemus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and this is a picture of what the adult looks like. Very beautiful, very large Saturnid silkworm moth. Uh, this was actually taken on the Dan Allen parking deck um, at NC State uh, with my cell phone. And, you know, it's big enough that even the cell phone takes a really beautiful picture of it. Now, uh, that cocoon is a fairly old co cocoon. It hung on there fairly well. It was probably from um, the, uh, the previous, uh, the, a couple years ago, basically, uh, because the adults are going to be emerging um, in the spring. And uh, then the larval activity will be from March through the fall. So basically, that would that had uh, if Mike had seen this empty case, 
uh, unless it had just emerged, which is probably not likely with the weather we've been getting lately, it would probably have emerged last spring, which means it had created the cocoon the previous fall. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's what it was, really beautiful moth. I'm be on the lookout for them. OK, so here we go. This was a Euonymus uh, planted in a churchyard and uh, from Wake County. Uh, so there's obviously something going on here. What do you think, critter or not? Okay, maybe 10 seconds. <laughs> People switching, maybe? All right, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, we've got a lot of response for Critter. Um, some response for not. Well, of course, this is a, a trick one, kind of. There was both a critter and a not critter on there. So there were the scourges of Euonymus, the Euonymus scale, and powdery mildew. So right here on the uh, left, you see the white male scales and these round female scales. And then, of course, these patches of powdery mildew on uh, the other leaf. And let me add that the yellowish spots on the euonymus leaf here correspond to powdery mildew infections on the other side of the leaf. So that's uh, not too bad so far. This is a case from Terrell County from a 4-H center with a viburnum that was slammed with this particular symptom. We're looking at the underside of the leaf here. The agent who submitted it back in October made the following comment. I think the big problem is insects, but I do see some rust pustules on a good many of the leaves. Now, to be fair, this one is one or the other. Don't try and say both for the response. Critter or not? Mm, nice spread. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> All right, about three more seconds. It looks like we've got a four. No, it's five to five. It's a tie. Well, this one turned out to actually be a critter. The actual culprit was the greenhouse thrips, heliotrips, hemorrhoidalis on this viburnum. So. Pass it back to Matt to comment on why it would have looked like rust. Yeah, yeah. So it's very interesting. This is my first experience with this thrips, and it's really amazing looking thrips. I think um, in that it's very rough, uh, kind of a blackish gray, and they call it hemorrhoidalis because they usually have a red tip to their abdomen. I'm not going to elaborate any further. Um, and uh, here's a juvenile and the adults all over. And what is actually looking like the rust pustules or fungus are actually the fecal spots of the adults, uh, which help to deter predators and uh, protect them. And the, these fecal spots are red at first and then turn black. And of course, the silvering on the image before is created because of the extensive feeding, uh, which causes this discoloration and, uh, and the pulling away of the surface of the leaf. Very, very heavy infestation. And I've, I actually saw a viburnum at the NC Zoo with very similar symptoms, which I'm sure is the greenhouse thrips as well. OK, uh, the next one. Uh, this is actually outside on NC State campus. This is a holly. 
a very large holly tree. Um, and uh, this is actually a photo that's backlit. So you can see the light coming through the leaves, uh, creating this very mottled pattern. Uh, so what do you think, critter or not? I see that some people are using their check boxes or the check X rather than the symbol planted on the on the page. So okay. maybe there's some people we haven't been counting. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty. It was a four to five split last one too on the. But here we've got a lot of people with saying it's not a critter. Okay, um, three, two, one. Okay, yes, it does look like a pathogen, but it's not. It is actually the feeding uh, damage of adult two-line spittle bugs on holly. This is one of their uh, the adult feeding hosts. And uh, the f they rest on the leaves and start to suck because they're a bug. They're going to have these sucking mouth parts start to suck on the leaves and this creates this damage, this uh, yellowing, uh, the yellow blotches on the, on the leaves. So that was a tricky one. Yeah, it does look like a disease, but it's actually caused by spittle bugs. And we should add that you won't find the adults this time of year. They were out several months ago and uh, in time to become, in, and my children become endeared to them. Mm -hmm. Another story. But uh, the damage is still persisting even now. Yes, and the uh, the young are going to be feeding on grass. So the young are very rarely seen, although that's what most of the feeding stage is. Uh, but the adults are obviously very common and very noticeable, uh, somewhat annoying at some points, other times kind of cute. Uh, but yes, this is what they can do to hollies. So moving right along. This is a little bit different. This is from a greenhouse situation. The plant is Florescenaria or Pericallis. And we see these lumpy looking growths, could it be, at the base of the main stem. Critter or not? Uh, five or six seconds more here. It's interesting that the folks who are putting the symbols on there are okay. All right. The ones who are putting the symbols over the X are correct. It is not a critter. That was, and this uh, slide is a different situation, but suspected to be the same organism. We diagnose it by symptoms. It's a little bit complicated to do a laboratory test, but the symptoms are sometimes good enough to let you know that you've got crown gall, which is caused by a bacterium. The common soil bacterium often invades through wounds in most cases, you'll see the galls form, and they become hard and woody on a woody plant like rose here. But they will form near the crown of the plant, thus the name. But they can also form down on the roots, as you see here, or in some plants like willow, for example. You can see them up farther on the stems where wounds had occurred. And somehow the bacterium got from the soil into the wound, possibly by a tool or other object having been on the ground. This can be a, a problem in plants like rose, willow, grape, and several others. Okay. All right. This is uh, one of the thin stems, branches of an azalea. Um, 
So critter or not? Okay, five, four, three, two, one. Okay, almost a landslide for the correct answer. This is a critter. Uh, this is actually peony scale. Uh, now, there are a number of types of armored scales that will insert themselves under the bark, and they have this really nice camouflage then. You can see the trichomes of the azalea branch are still over top of the actual scale. And so when you basically uh, remove the tests, the covering, you will find this nice uh, female scale sitting there, a um, little bag of, of mush. And now one of the clues for the scales that are living under bark, there's some that are even more difficult to see than this peony scale on the azalea. Uh, are to look for the very tiny first crawler shed skins that usually sit right near the um, right near the uh, actual living scale that has matured. So that's one of the clues to look for when you're looking for scales that are under bark. Here we have Amazonia. Amazing coincidence here that Charlotte talked about. Amsonia earlier in the program. This was from near the Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh. And there is something that doesn't belong here on the stem. Critter or not? Pat, have you noticed that we, we do have people who do their own uh, thinking, aren't swayed by the crowd because we, even though there's a landslide sometimes, we'll still get a few dissenters there, so that's always good to see. Yes, independent thinking is great. Well, another landslide and another uh, correct answer for the majority here. This was one of the wax scales, and I'll let Nat talk about it. Looks kind of like a helmet from uh, <laughs> ancient Greek warrior, or Trojan warrior, but yeah, it's, they're pretty cool. They're pretty cool little scales. Now they these are a type of soft scale, and you can see right here all these little pores. Um, those are diagnostic for the different species, and the way that wax coating is created is diagnostic for different species. This is probably the barnacle scale, um, but very a little difficult to identify. Um, now they do create this thick waxy coating that um, some uh, tribes and, and uh, Aboriginal people in different areas have even used for chewing gum. Um, a friend of mine tried it, said it wasn't that great. Um, but uh, yeah, these are these are common. Different species are common on different types of plants, on woody and herbaceous plants. I was very surprised to see this just sitting there on this nice little herbaceous plant. Okay, let's see. What do we have next? Okay, so this is a firethorn, a pyracantha, from I think from Wake County. Um, just uh, out in the landscape, and it's got this thing on it, this knobby, fuzzy thing on it. Um, now, for a closer look, uh, this is what it looks like a little bit closer up. So, is this a critter or not? Okay, a uh, 
few more seconds. A lot of density or not. Yeah, but kind of a top. What's that? Count it down. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, no, I got a landslide on this one. Yeah. Not yeah, not yet. Some people jumped in at the end. And this is actually a very deceptive one, but it is a critter. It's very interesting. Now, the white fuzz might think, lead you to think it's some kind of fungus. Uh, the knobbiness might lead you to think it's a canker of some sort. But this is actually woolly apple aphids, uh, Ariosoma landigrum, on, on the pyracantha. Now, we have a big bush outside of our office uh, on the NC State campus that has been affected by these. Now, normally, there are two stages of them. The, many of them will feed on the roots. But there is also a stage that will feed on the actual branches. And they're very interesting critters in that they oftentimes go toward pruned areas uh, or areas where there's damage in the branches. And when they start to uh, infest the area and suck on it, they actually create galls. Now, not galls in the normal sense in that they're inside of it like a lot of other insects and groups, but they create these kind of gnarled uh, uh, looks as you can see obviously in this in this these pictures. Um, so uh, this is actually a woolly apple aphid, and the the fuzz can does come off of them a little bit. So some of them look a little bit more fuzzy than others, especially the more mature ones. But if you look up close, you will see little tiny aphids. You may have noticed for a moment there that at least on my connection here, Matt's voice got high pitched. I don't think he's got any helium balloons in there, but what happens is on the interface sometimes the connection gets slowed down and then it tries to catch up by speeding the audio. This is actually another greenhouse situation from here on campus where the material you can see in the upper portion, sort of fuzzy on the stem of the Nemesia. Critter or not? I guess we probably should speed this up a little bit. All right, we will do that. Uh, this turned out to be gray mold, Botrytis cinerea, which is a fungus that is quite common in greenhouses, especially if the humidity gets too high. And this is what the sporulation looks like. But it also forms, so you're not confused again by another possible uh, critter or not situation. These black objects here connected to the stem or attached to the stem, in this case of Helleborus, are the sclerotia or resting structures of the fungus. Here's another example of sclerotia of a different fungus, sclerotinia, inside the stem of uh, nigella from the commercial planting. Okay, and the last one. This is a uh, close-up of uh, the bark of a of on the uh, branch of a willow oak. Um, so, critter or not? It's an interesting-looking one. Okay, uh, five, four, three, two, one. So a little bit on the critter side, more so than the not side. Well, everybody's right. It's uh, both a critter and not a critter. So this is Septobacidium. Uh, this is a fungus that has a symbiotic relationship with scale insects. Uh, so if you were to pull off that fungus, you would find some scale insects underneath. Uh, what happens is the 
Um, this, the fungus grows on the top of the scales and it actually infects some of the individuals and feeds on their bodies, but the rest of the individuals that are under there gain protection from parasites and predators and such. So it's uh, here you see a zoomed out version of lots of Septobacidium on here. That means there are scales underneath. And uh, so it's a very interesting relationship. So you see the fungus, but you know there's also scales on there. Very cool little drawing here of what the scale uh, looks like underneath the fungus. Okay, so how did everybody do? We don't want to make it too easy for everybody or too difficult, so hopefully uh, it was a nice balance. Well, that's good. Looks like a couple of them were tricky, uh, but some of them were fairly obvious. Well, great job. You there, Mike? Uh, Mike, I think you have to turn your microphone on. Um, at least I can't hear you. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. This is a reprise of a sample that was shown, or a picture that was shown in a couple of earlier plant specimen pathogens. It's the gardenia that had cold injury. Now, with polar vortices and all, we may be seeing some more cold injury this year, but there's more to this particular situation, and I'll get back to that later. So uh, those of you old enough to remember Paul Harvey, you'll get the rest of the story in a little bit. But I chose in the future for this particular program to talk about some of the problems that we see on junipers. And I'll have to move through it fairly quickly because of the time, but I think uh, it will be worthwhile. First, let me ask whether you think the picture here represents a problem of root rot, of rust, or of tip blight, because we'll talk about problems in all three of these categories. So you can either use your polling tool or the spots on the screen on the whiteboard. All right, interestingly enough, this is this is a bit of a tricky one. It's root rot. Tip blight will sometimes occur on juniper. Typically, and this is not going to be a good 100% rule, but typically the color isn't quite that washed out straw look. And when we see that particular coloration, especially if we see that the damage is fading as you go from the tip down to the base of the plant and not just very sharp at one point on the branch or twig, then we suspect that it's something lower down. Either the base of the plant has a problem or the roots or the soil. And in this case, it was root rot. If we look at the scale, uh, no pun intended there, Matt, of damage caused by different diseases on woody plants. This is just sort of my own ranking of these, but I think most of my colleagues would uh, not take too much issue with it. Leaf spots are really the most, or the least damaging that we have, and actually things that we can sometimes use chemical control on. Cankers and diebacks would be second in importance, although some very serious ones such as chestnut blight. Root rots, more serious yet, and then vascular wilt like laurel wilt, Dutch elm disease, and oak wilt would be our most serious. So we're going to be talking about something in the third category here of the root rot. A picture of the entire planting of the shore junipers that were shown in the first slide there, 
with the question. And we can see that it had moved up the previous year to this. It was only on one plant, according to the grower. And then it spread throughout this hillside planting. And it turned out that this was one that we don't see all that often, but is worth mentioning. And oh, let me back up a moment. How would you know that you had a root rod and not a tip light? Well, apart from the color and the pattern on the branches themselves, look at the roots. Woody plants often have dark colored roots on the outside, but if you grab them between the thumb and forefinger of each hand and gently tug or firmly in some cases, you'll notice that the outer portion of the root will slough off and slide along the inner tougher woody vascular tissue. So that's a sign that you do actually have a root rot going on. It may or may not be an infectious disease, but you know that you've got roots that are decaying. In the case of that juniper in the previous photos, it turned out to have what we call a nosum root rot caused by the fungus heterobasidion anosum, and you may remember it under its older name of Fomi's anosis. The good thing, if you can say that, about this is that it's only going to affect conifers, such as juniper and pine, so that you're safe to plant other kinds of trees and shrubs, although if there's a heavy population in, let's say, growing in a, a stand of a susceptible plant, there could be other species affected. Usually, you will not see any signs visible to the unaided eye if this fungus is causing the problem. When you get to the point of having a dead stump, you may see some of the conchs growing at the ground line that are the spore-producing bodies of the fungus. It spreads not only by those spores if they land on stumps, freshly cut stumps, but also by root contact. So in the picture on the left, you can see that the fungus would be spreading through this pine stand here underneath and, and getting damage that could cause lodging. There are, of course, other root pathogens on juniper. We've talked on the program a couple of times about arvillaria or mushroom root rot, which is a true fungus and is often diagnosable in the field by looking under the bark at the base of the tree or main stem or even in the larger roots and identifying the white to cream colored mat of fungal mycelium there, either on the outside of the wood or the inside of the bark. Whereas with Phytophthora, these are micrographs of sporangia of a species of Phytophthora. You're going to have to have a laboratory analysis in order to get a diagnosis. The important difference here, not only is that it's a different kind of organism, but that the control measures are different. If you've got armillaria, you can remove the roots and stump, wait at least a year, although we've seen cases where that probably wasn't enough, before you come back with any kind of woody plant because so many are susceptible. In the case of Phytophthora, you just give up because you know that the Phytophthora is going to persist in the soil, and you look for some resistant or tolerant plant species to use in place of the one that died. We have a publication out there, AG747, which has information on cultural controls and replacement plants for Phytophthora situations. Also, in the case of Armillaria or Heterobasidium, we may recommend if it's a line of trees or shrubs to remove not only the plant that died, but also its immediate neighbors because it has probably already spread through the soil to the adjacent plants. Changing gears a little bit to another group of diseases that get on junipers. A classic picture from the Plant Pathology Department slide collection here. What's wrong with this scenario? Well, what's wrong is that we've got Towering junipers here, and then a tiny little crab apple or apple tree, and that's a recipe for disaster in terms of gymnosporangium rusts, where the fungus has to alternate between two different kinds of hosts, the juniper and a woody rosaceous plant. Sometimes it's an apple or crab apple, sometimes it's other things, uh, Cretaceous, amelanchier even, um, quince where the spores blow from the spring onto the rosaceous host, and in the summer, it spoilates on that host and blows back over onto the junipers. The disease pictured here, we'll shorten this because of time, but we've got several different rusts that uh, cause similar symptoms. Peter apple rust, quince rust, hawthorn rust, and others. 
And in this particular case, it was none of the above. This is a picture of one that we do not yet have in North Carolina, to my knowledge. The last one on the list here, Gymnosporangium yamidae, or the Japanese apple rust. Others that we do have would include our severe apple rust, quince rust, and hawthorn rust. But don't take these common names too seriously because they're not restricted to those hosts. They all do alternate, though, with juniper species. The picture is yet another kind of rust on the trunk of a tree here on campus, a juniper. Let's see if anybody can fill in the blank here. Cedar apple rust has a life cycle consisting of how long? One year, two years, three years, or more? I can even type in here. I'm not having luck with the text tool. Uh, we go. Nope, it turns out that this one has a two year life cycle in which the pathogen, and we talk about plants, pests, and pathogen, but we don't ever talk about what does pathogen mean. It's just the organism that causes disease. The pathogen, in this case, the fungus, overwinters in the infected twigs on the cedar tree. And there will be no visible symptoms that first winter. The gall will develop, as you see in the lower photograph, during the following year. And then the next spring, completing the two-year life cycle, it will produce the gelatinous masses that we call telial horns, on which the spores are produced and carried on the wind to the alternate host, such as an apple or a crab apple. One good thing about this particular case is that once that has produced its spores, the gall is dead. The fungus is no longer active. That's not true with all of these, though. It would be a typical symptom of cedar apple rust on apple. Notice that this particular one can get on both leaves and fruit. Quince rust in the same genus is much less conspicuous, just small swellings on the branches of the cedar tree, but at the right time of year, they will be producing a similar gelatinous material on which the spores are produced. And here we've shown pictures before of what it'll do on ornamental pear, both on the twigs and on the fruit. Similar symptoms uh, have been seen here on campus on amelanch here on the service berry fruit, but I haven't been able to actually definitively identify which rust that is. The third group of problems that we can get on juniper are tip blights. And two of them are the Phenopsis tip blight and Cavatina tip blight. Very similar symptoms of just the smallest twigs dying, although Phenopsis can cause extensive damage on younger plants. In this case, you would want to either send it to the laboratory for confirmation or make note of the fact that Cabotina will attack in the fall, and you'll start seeing symptoms this time of year. So things showing up in February on branches, twigs that were produced last year. Whereas Phomopsis will attack succulent material anytime during the growing season. Of course, the dead twigs can persist, so you might be confused if you didn't see what it looked like in the fall. In either case, pruning is going to be the recommendation. Go at least two inches into clean wood and just remove those from the area. The spores would be rain splashed, so don't work with the plants when they are wet because you may spread spores around and do more harm than good. The last group I want to go through very quickly here, not really an ignored group, but one that we don't see very often because it's under the soil. In this case, uh, the particular example is uh, going to be boxwood, and it has very bright orange foliage. Again, this is not something happening in the leaves themselves. It is the result of lesion nematode damage. So these form dead spots or lesions on the roots. You can see damaged and healthy there in the side-by-side. -side. And it's one of 
many, many nematodes that live in our soils, particularly in our seas, but all of them have in common that they're microscopic, except for some of the, uh, the ones that are animal parasites. And most of these are actually free living. They don't cause damage. They're just feeding on bacteria or fungi in the soil and so forth. But some are parasites, a few of animals, and a few of plants. And with plants, they're mostly feeding on the roots. It turns out, though, that how much damage you get really depends on which nematode is on which plant and how many of them there are. So azalea, we would get problems with stunt nematode, whereas with boxwood, we would get lesion nematode and spiral nematode, although occasionally root knot will get it on it in the coastal plain. And then the general level of stress on the plant is going to determine how much damage there is because a root system that is compromised by nematodes will be less able to provide water and nutrients to the plant. Most people think of root knot nematode when they think of nematode damage, but may not be aware that the size of the galls depends on the host species. So on the ryope, which we see fairly commonly with root knot, we don't get necessarily the large galls that you would on some other hosts. In fact, you've got to be careful not to confuse the, the galls with the swellings that are normal storage swellings on the roots of Loriope and Ophiopogon and Daylily. But here the, the galls would be much smaller, actually. And we dissect them out to see if the nematode is actually in there. So going back to the rest of the story here, this particular gardenia had not only the cold damage, but it had an infection of root knot nematode and was removed from this particular landscape. And I have to take the blame here because this was at our own house. I felt kind of under pressure to get this plant in the ground and should have known better and, and checked it. It's one of those rare cases where we could get a nematode infection coming out of the, uh, the trade and actually go into the landscape. In most cases, nematodes are not going to be a problem on container-grown nursery stock. And I ought to point out that nematode symptoms may go unnoticed. This is from a research site, but if you had it in the landscape, you might not realize even that that plant on the right was stunted because it had nematodes feeding on the roots. Only in comparison with a healthy plant do we see the difference. Quickly then, what to look for in March and April? Detritus diseases on a number of plants. Strawberry, for example, on the fruit, rose can get on the cane, pansy draining in the greenhouse, sclerotinia stem rot, especially on our crucifers, but can get on a few other ornamental or a few ornamental plants such as snapdragon and some perennials. Leaf spots and anthracnose on Japanese maple when they leaf out. Fire blight on apple and pear, photograph on the right. Downy mildew of crucifers and exobacidium leaf gall, as you see in the photograph on the left. That would be on camellias and occasionally on azaleas and rhododendron. Right off the root rot is a continuing problem to watch for on many woody plants in the landscape. Also, entomosporium leaf spot on photinia if there are any out there left, and Indian hawthorn spot and thracnose of dogwood when those begin to bloom. Camellia petal blight, likewise, picture on the right. Powder and mildew on just about everything, and brown patch and spring dead spot on turf. Back to you, Lucy. OK, any questions for Mike? Mike, thank you. And Matt, thank you as well. Um, we are at a little after 12, and I know many of you have to go. There are some announcements. If you can stick around for a couple of minutes, uh, I'd love to, to share with you. Um, otherwise, we will see you back here um, in May, right, or April. We'll look at that date for you here. I'm going to sneak back up to the... Lucy, I had a question for Matt. Do you want me to do that sure. now or wait for after the announcements? Um, give me just a second for the announcements and then ask. How about that? That's fine. That's fine. Thanks. OK. So we have the Master Gardener conferences coming up. Hope all of you are already registered. And if not, that you'll register very soon. It's going to be May 5th through the 7th in Winston-Salem. They have an awesome program laid out, some, some superb keynote speakers and tours and all of the wonderful things that you would expect from a North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Conference. They have set up a website at NorthCarolinaMasterGardener.org, and you can register right there online. 
Also coming up is the Davidson Horticultural Symposium that's on March 4th and the website for more information about that. Thanks, Edna, for putting the, the next date up there, April 22nd. <coughs> okay, and, and here are more things that are coming up. So the, the Davidson List Kerr Lake Horticultural Symposium in, in Henderson, North Carolina is going to be on the 8th. Our next webinar is on the 22nd. Um, join us a little bit early. We're going to try doing the announcements ahead of time. Um, and so those will happen before the 10 o'clock launch of, of, of the meeting. Master Gardener Conference May 5th through the 7th and the Southern Region Master Gardener Conference is going to be in Baton Rouge this year, October 21st through the 24th. Okay, we have a new website for the plants, pests, and pathogens. We have moved it into the gardening portal. So if you go to gardening.ces.ncsu.edu, click on those signature programs and the signature programs are up here at the top and they're, the programs are in alphabetical order so you come down to plants, pests, and pathogens. What we've done is, is decided to keep the actual program itself private to Extension Horticulture Agents and Extension Master Gardener Volunteers but open up the recordings of the sessions to make those available to the public. So we've moved the information about the program to this public website. The links will continue to be on, on the protected website um, on the Master Gardener intranet. Okay, a question for Matt. Yes, this is Charlotte. I have a question that um, I was asked by Master Gardeners in another county this past week um, that someone had called their office and had a praying mantis egg case they had brought inside and the praying mantises had all hatched mm. and so they had all these baby praying mantises <laughs> and this person wanted to do something to save them. Okay. So what could they feed them? What, the, what should they do? <laughs> okay. Well, um, first of all, you should suggest that they separate them because they will eat each other. Um, so that may solve the problem and you'll have one grand mantis at the end. Um, but if, uh, if they want to keep a bunch of them, uh, separate them into different containers. There's the small ones can live in fairly small containers. They don't need a lot of, you know, you don't need to throw in a bunch of vegetation or anything like that. Um, and then get them, uh, go to the, the pet store and get some small crickets. Uh, anything uh, basically half the size or smaller. Uh, you don't want to get anything too tiny. But they're very opportunistic predators. They're going to eat whatever is moving in their little cage. Um, and uh, that may keep them, and uh, they should be able to molt. So you'll probably want to put a little bit of a moist, not very wet, but paper towel in there just to keep it a little bit humid in there, not to dry them out or anything. But they also get a lot of their uh, liquids from their diet. So, yeah, just going by them. Some of the small um, mealworms might be taken by the a little bit later instars, the a little bit older immatures. But uh, basically anything you can find, they're basically going to eat that's a good size for them. And you can see kind of what the adults eat in relative to size to get an idea of what the really small ones will eat. Thank you. We were stumped on what to tell them to feed them this time of year because nothing was out there, but I hadn't even thought about crickets. Yeah, that's that's the kind of the go-to in the winter months. I have that that large centipede that I have in the lab. Um, we were feeding it smoky brown cockroaches, but again, this time of year we don't find many of them. Uh, so I went out to the store and bought some crickets just to keep her holding her over until we get some more insects coming out. Thanks. Okay, cue the exit music. Thank you guys for joining us, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>